Lawmakers passed it, Governor Quinn signed it, and now unions are threatening to sue. We'll talk all things pension reform next on Capitol View. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Capital View, the show where we talk about Illinois government and politics. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn with Illinois Issues Magazine. And with me today is Bill, Bill Wheelhouse, Executive Editor with WUIS. Bill, glad to have you on the show. Great to be on. And Kent Redfield, Emeritus Professor of Political Science with UIS. Good to have you here, Professor. Good to be here. And Pat Yeagle, reporter with Illinois Times. Pat, glad you're here. Thanks for having me. So it's, uh, we've been talking about pension reform, I think, on probably every episode of the show, as long as I've been on it. <laughs> Lawmakers finally passed legislation on Tuesday um, after negotiations went on through the summer and leadership eventually had to step in to hammer out a deal. Bill, what are we looking at here in this final deal? Well, in just the big picture is they are reducing the cost of living adjustments for state employees who are retiring. If uh, you're a younger state employee, it'll be a little while longer before you could retire, and uh, the employees will have to shell out just a, a little bit less than what they shelled out before. But, but the big thing is that they are not going to give the 3% cost of living adjustments, which many have said is one of the systematic problems of the Illinois pension system. And I, I think that's the, the biggest thing that has a lot of people frustrated uh, on the labor side and uh, the retiree side. Yeah, a lot of the debate has focused on that cost of living increase. It's a 3% compounded um, cost of living increase right now. It gets quite pricey, but um, union officials and, and workers say, you know, that's part of our benefits that are pr protected by the Constitution. Professor Redfield, where did we land on the COLAs and kind of, you know, how did we get here? Well, the, w there have been cost of living increases as part of the pension system for a long time. But back in the 80s, we moved to this more standard kind of 3% compounded every year rather than doing a percentage of inflation. And so when percentage is, when inflation's low, as it has been for the last 10 years, uh, retirees are making out very well. When inflation is high, then not so much. And what is really driving it from a cost side is compounded. You get 3% that becomes part of your base. The next year you get 3% and the next, that becomes part of your base. And so that was, that really has been a huge driver of the system uh, in terms of the cost. Uh, it's why the costs go up. Now, if the system had been adequately funded, we wouldn't be as in a big a hole. There's no question that that's a very generous benefit, but it, it becomes a huge problem when you don't make pension payments, which is, is what we didn't do. And so now, uh, in addition to maybe $80 billion coming out of diminished benefits, then there's another $80 billion that involves taking revenue streams from bonds that are being paid off, taking pension savings, a number of other things that are supposed to, over the course of the whole package, 30 years, reduce costs by about $160 billion. And, and we're talking about the costs that the state has to pay out of the general revenue fund. Money for pensions doesn't go to health care, doesn't go to uh, schools. And, and so uh, we are, there's also an unfunded liability that is coming down. We're not wiping it out by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, some of the critics of the system of, of the deal rather are saying, well, you really didn't, you know, get rid of this hundred billion dollars. But, you know, we've gotten, we were behind the curve and falling behind. This deal, if it works, if it stands up, if the numbers are good, would get us, you know, ahead of the curve. And, and that's, that's, that makes everything manageable and predictable. Well, and the new COLA provisions, they're, they're kind of complicated and they vary depending on which system you're in and how long you've worked, but they're tied to inflation, right, Professor? They will grow over time if it, we see inflation go up. Yes, it, it starts with a base of um, $800 if you're in a system that has Social Security, 1000 if if not, times how many years of service. If you're a 30-year employee, uh, retiree with 30 years service, you get 
your COLA on $30,000 of your annuity. If your annuity is $30,000, you get 3% of that. If your annuity is $60,000, you get 3% of $30,000. And so then that $800 and that $1,000 are index, indexed to inflation. And so they would increase if inflation goes up. But it is a big hit for people who have salaries in anything that's over fifty, sixty thousand. 60,000. It's unlikely that you're going to be, you know, not take a pretty big hit in terms of, of what's going on. It was designed to be less onerous on people who had worked for a long time that had small annuities. Well, and Professor Redfield touched on that there were several folks um, who felt that this bill didn't go far enough. A lot of Republicans moved away from the bill when maybe they had supported previous plans in the past. Pat, what are folks that think this bill doesn't do enough looking for? Um, probably the biggest thing that they're looking for is to change the state um, retirement system from defined benefits where everybody knows exactly what they're going to get when they retire to a defined contribution plan where everybody knows exactly what they put in and what they get back out of it depends a lot on the markets and um, you know uh, a lot of other circumstances like that. Um, that I think is the biggest one that they were hoping to get and there is something small like that in this bill or I guess it's, it's law now but um, but it was a, it's a very limited kind of almost a trial run to see how it works out. And um, I think only, what, 5% of the um, retirees can even be in that system. So and it's um, I think that was kind of perhaps put in there as a way to say, hey, look, you know, we're trying your idea. Um, you know, come with us on this little journey and let's see how it turns out. But um, a lot of people, I think, saw through that and said, well, that's not what we were asking for. We want the whole system to go that way. And of course, Governor Quinn signed the bill today when we're taping the show, and I've already chatted with some union folks who are, are upset by that move and looking to uh, launch a lawsuit as soon as they can possibly get their ducks in a row to do that. Um, Bill, you know, what, what, what leg do they have to stand on here? Explain a little bit about the constitutional well, portion of this. Well, in the Constitution, and uh, I can't quote it specifically, but uh, there, are, there are a couple of lines in there, all referring to the pension. And it says uh, essentially that the pension shall not be diminished. And uh, some people say by reducing what uh, the raise I was supposed to get or that I'm getting uh, my retirement only on or the increase only on a portion of my uh, annuity rather than the whole thing, that that is diminishment of, uh, of the pension benefits. And that is the biggest issue that I think people were wrestling with from the beginning, and I think it's the biggest issue that will be presented to a court when a court is listening to this. I think what it is interesting how much effort that has been made and on the legislation and the proposals we've had to uh, make it seem as if there is not diminishment taking place, that there was somehow some choice on employees' parts, and I think that will be a key element when it comes before the courts. And also to make it seem as though this is maybe the only option that the cuts have been made, taxes have been increased, and now this is the option that, that has to be taken to uh, solidify the state's fiscal situation. Professor, a lot of folks are saying now, you know, it's been a long journey. How did we get here? What, what, what political components <laughs> brought us to this promised land of pension mm -hmm. reform for the folks who want to see it happen anyway? To, I mean, what came together was we really had a system that was balanced, uh, but we started in the 70s, 80s, 90s, not paying those uh, amounts that would allow you to sustain it. We also put benefits on top of where the system was. Uh, we had early retirement, and kind of the Bogoyevich years in terms of both uh, borrowing some money and to essentially refinance it and use the money other places. And then uh, uh, the Great Recession, which just killed everybody's investments, including, including the pension funds. And we got to a point where it was unsustainable. And so it was a long journey in terms of the Democrats generally want to back the, the, our pro-labor and they don't want to uh, diminished benefits. Uh, Republicans were saying we need reform, we need to get rid of the system, and you know we had a back and forth with the 
Senate President's bill that was supposed to provide consideration in terms of taking away benefits, the Speaker's bill, which was basically saying this is emergency powers, we've got a crisis. And, you know, it kind of, you know, the governor at one point refused to sign the legislation funding the General Assembly's payroll. I mean, there's been a lot of theor theory, a lot of theater in this, but ultimately, you know, we had to do something in relation to the budget, either more revenue, cut spending, or cut benefits, and it became a, politically a position where I think the speaker felt that we can't go to the 2014 election without having passed something. And generally when the speaker makes up his mind that something needs to be done in terms of positioning his members for the next election, uh, it gets done. It wasn't easy. I, you know, there's, you know, I'm, you know, there's, there are lots of moving parts, but ultimately it doesn't get done unless the speaker says this is necessary in terms of my members for the next election. Well, and speaking of the election, we saw a lot of politics come into play, especially folks who are hoping to be in the governor's office after uh, next year. Pat, uh, you know, what happened there as far as a lot of the uh, Republicans who really had uh, a lot to say about <laughs> it? Um, I mean, how do you think that played out with lawmakers and, and how do you think they're positioning themselves uh, looking for support as they're moving forward? I think the, the biggest um, thing that came out of this was um, Kirk Dillard, uh, Senator Kirk Dillard trying to position himself um, as uh, a friend of the union in order to um, basically compete with, with has a lot more money at his uh, disposal than any of the other candidates actually combined. Um, and so I think uh, most likely Senator Dillard was um, hoping, he of course voted um, against the bill. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, that was basically his um, his way of saying, Union, if you'll you know if you'll back me, um, because I really need your help, and so that was probably his um, his kind of cry for help. Um, some of the other I one other thing. Yeah, um, I think the other thing is he w he was also there seeing that Bruce Rauner, a candidate who's going to have a lot of money, was against this. Yeah, definitely. This takes away one area <laughs> where that man with a lot of money right, right now can attack him, and yeah. I think that was another reason that uh, he. Uh, kind of took his ever-moving stance on some issues <laughs> in that direction. Definitely, definitely. Well, and we saw um, former House Minority Leader Tom Cross, who has played a large role in this process, vote against the bill. That was a little bit of a surprise. Bill, what do you think of that? He didn't say much. He definitely didn't come over and talk to us in the press box about it, why he took that vote. In, <laughs> in the big thing, I, I don't think that many people are worried about what Tom Cross does now. He's running for another office. And uh, it is one of those fiscal offices uh, for the state. Is he's running for treasurer? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on that one. No, he but, is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was but, looking around at a couple offices. So, so, so. I, so I think he took that. Well, that's will make me look like I'm fiscally responsible with that stance. But it, not many people really care where the treasurer stands on an issue, <laughs> and. Uh, so I, I don't think his vote was all that concerning to it, that many people. And the people. thought being that maybe he's looking for some, some money support in, in his race from Very the well folks could that, be. that didn't like the bills. So. Yeah, and the big, the big Republican money, when you start to talk names like the Griffins, uh, uh, Jack Rozier, uh, you know, uh, Rod Gidwich, you know, the people that either have money or the big money raised, the people that can raise a lot of money, uh, they're firmly in Bruce Rauner's camp. They are also firmly on this idea that a defined uh, benefit system is unsustainable and that we need to go to defined contribution. And, and frankly, on that issue, this is about, you know, either, either system properly designed is sustainable. It's a question of who bears the risk. And in the private sector, we have shifted away from the risk being for retirement being borne by corporations and are now borne by employees, the 401ks. And this is the same thing that we're seeing in terms of the big fights with uh, public uh, sector unions is whether the state should bear a risk or whether the risk should be borne by the state employee in terms of uh, 
of retirement. So it's, you know, it is about whether the system's designed right and right amount of money coming in, but it's also a huge philosophical disagreement between where the responsibility lies and, and, and should government be guaranteeing pensions or should it be on the, on the, on the individual employee. Another thing I think that's interesting about it being, it's Illinois, it's something different. It's Democrats that led the way, traditionally those who have been friends of labor, and uh, it were the Republicans that were voting against it more, not for the reason unions would like. But I, I, you find that interesting in the state of Illinois that uh, it was all Democrats. Nobody would suspect that uh, what l the unions considered to be the most anti-labor legislation in nearly 20 years was uh, put through by Democrats. We, go ahead, Jeff. I would like to go back to uh, one thing that uh, Professor Redfield mentioned um, about when this, uh, the state skipped payments you know, through the 70s and 80s. Um, and I would just like to make the point that one of the reasons we skipped those payments back then was because we couldn't properly fund services. So we took money away from the pensions in order to throw money at our social services that we were not funding adequately. So in a, cent in a roundabout way, this all comes back to tax is not sustainable, then it has long um, rippling effects on these other areas like pensions, where we've robbed the pension, basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, and so if we're going to, you know, if we're going to do this pension thing, you know, of course, let's, let's figure out a, a solution. But in the long term, we, we still have a problem, a structural problem with the, uh, the state's income system. So. Well, and Bill, I think you, you make a good point on, um, you know, Democrats being usually allies of the unions. Governor Quinn has definitely had his share of union protests. He signed the bill behind closed doors today, presumably maybe to avoid another one. Um, but the governor's in an awkward position here. He needed to get this done. He made this his issue. But now the unions are not real thrilled with him. Professor, wh how do you think this will play out during the election? Uh, who else can they be friends with? Well, <laughs> but they can be friends with no one. And, and obviously that's, you know, that that's 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 an option but you know campaigns are always relational and so you know do I want to vote for X well who is X running against and you know if we have Bruce Rauner as a nominee talking about right to work talking about uh, defined uh, contribution systems uh, talking about uh, the evils of public employee unions then uh, Governor Quinn might look a lot more attractive. And, and so it's always a question of, of, of kind of, you know, wh what are your alternatives? And, and obviously not participating is one of the alternatives. I mean, big labor in terms of trade unions, the service employee unions, I think they're going to look at life under a Republican, life under a Democrat, and they're, you know, it's not going to be as hard for them to come to the Democratic Party uh, and to, to Governor Quinn as it will be for the public employee unions. And, and uh, so it's, you know, it's a big issue and, and, and part of it is, is, is for, for those unions and, and what are their options. Well, it just occurred to me, we have a pretty university employee heavy panel today. So I just kind of want to do the discla disclaimer that we often do, that many of us are will someday be eligible for a pension or maybe are already drawing pensions. Uh, but I think we're all growing up enough to be able to handle that and, uh, you know, give you the give you the fair take on this. Um, we were talking a little bit about the sh before the show about how this passing this bill is kind of capping off a lot of activity in the past few years under Governor Quinn in the General Assembly. They've been doing a lot, I mean, over a long span of time, but we've seen the death penalty abolition, we've seen same-sex marriage, we've seen medical marijuana passed, a uh, temporary tax increase. Professor Redfield, what can they do next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the trick is going to be trying to figure out how to balance the budget and whether they can count the pension savings or not, which partially depends on, on the litigation. Uh, you know, this was a big win for the governor in terms of he said, you know, this is why I was put on earth to solve this, this problem. And, and, and so it's a big political win for him. The, the issues are there if you want to take off the laundry list. Now, the other side of the coin is $9 billion of unpaid bills, slow economic growth. But, you know, it clearly, the governor has a record to, to run on. And, you know, a lot of that is about the speaker having a record to run on. And, you know, the speaker was the one that took the unions on on the two-tiered system that worked on the agreements on, uh, on, on Medicaid. And, 
uh, you know, eventually shepherded through the, the same-sex marriage, uh, the death penalty. You know, those are, are issues that have, have got multiple sides to them. But the whole idea, coming in with budgets under the governor's figures, the whole idea is we're the new Democrats, we're the post bogoyevich Democrats, we can govern. And I think Pat Quinn is going to benefit from that, but I would not, you know, the outside money, the Republicans look at the state of Illinois, this is a place where we can pick up a seat. And this is going to be an incredibly expensive battle. The governor's better off than he was yesterday. But I wouldn't, by any stretch of imagination, say he's in good shape as far as November is concerned. No, but I do think the governor who, on these kinds of talk shows especially, has never gotten much respect. People are always saying, well, he didn't show leadership once again. 20, 30 years down the road, they're going to look back, and if you say, what happened under this governor, this governor, this governor, all of a sudden, Pat Quinn is going to have this long list of items, whether it be same-sex marriage, medical marijuana, this changing the pension system. And uh, so he may have had trouble working with lawmakers, he may have had trouble leading, but uh, the accomplishments are getting checked off under, under his name. And so that's kind of a long-term interest is the, the guy that sometimes people underestimate is uh, getting a whole new boost. Now, why he was put on earth, I assume before he was put on earth to fix pensions, I thought it was to reduce the size of the legislature and create the Citizens Utility Board, so it is a change there. Sometimes it depends on who comes afterward right. that right. makes you feel great about the guy who yeah. just left. <laughs> well, and I think that's a good point, Professor Redfield, and you made that this like post Blagojevich Democrats. Bill, how much do you think of this is just like a bottling up of things not getting done under the past administration? Well, a lot of it is, I mean, government was at a total standstill under the Blagojevich years. Uh, a lot of things got done under George Ryan in the early part of his term, uh, but I, I do think some of it is moving forward. But on the other side of the coin, same-sex marriage doesn't naturally occur. You've got to have certain people ready to support it. So in that sense, uh, I think it's just that its time came and he happened to be governor. It wasn't who who the predecessor was or previous in action. And that seemed to be a case on a few of these social issues that we're listing here, looking at uh, at the death penalty abolition, looking at medical marijuana, that the, the social opinion tide had turned on some of those Yeah, things. most certainly. Most you have certainly. to have, I mean, the governor, you have to have a governor who's willing to sign it, obviously, but governors probably get too much credit when good things happen and too much blame when bad things happen. In the happen. same way that the president often does yeah. as well. Um, I, I mean, how much on some of these things, is it a hope to get a, some of these done while there's maybe still a governor who will sign them or maybe just get them off the list before we're getting into the election? I I don't think, you know, I, I, you know we're, we're trying to posture individual members, individual caucuses in relation to the next election and, and, and I, I don't, think that there's kind of a, we need this laundry list assuming we're going to win or lose the governor's office. It, it uh, you know, there's just way too much uh, time between now and, and next November in terms of, of what might or might not happen. Uh, it could look a lot better or a lot worse for Governor Quinn. Uh, uh, it's, it's very hard to tell at this point. For individual lawmakers, I don't think this issue really is a make or break issue too much could have been a break issue for those who had state universities or state prisons in their district. Um, and a lot of those people voted against it. But by and large, while the public, if you brought the issue to them, they said, yeah, we see these pensions and they seem, the increases seem outrageous. Day to day, that wasn't the thinking necessarily on their mind. But I think it showed the strength Speaker Madigan in the last uh, several weeks coming forth with this and finally moving it fast. Uh, and also he had a role in getting uh, the necessary votes for same-sex marriage. I think it let the speaker show his muscle a little bit again at a time where, because uh, his daughter didn't run for governor and there were a few incidents going on. People were starting to say, oh, I think the Speaker of the House has lost it. I think Speaker Madigan has kind of shown that he's probably still a figure to be reckoned with. And I'm sure many people realize that all along, but I think uh, he certainly is not shy about taking credit 
for his role in getting this legislation passed. Yeah, he's really taking ownership of, uh, of the final negotiation. He did a lot of what they called shuttle diplomacy, going back and forth and working out some details between the, the Democrats and Republicans on this bill. So it does seem to be a message that, uh, you know, he's not anywhere near being put out to pasture yet. Professor Redfield, moving forward on the on the court case here, what, what can we expect um, you know, what, what's kind of going on behind the scenes as far as people trying to prepare well, for this? Well, now that it's been signed, there is something to sue. The, it has not taken effect, and so how quickly the litigation moves is going to depend on the judge and it's going to depend on the litigants. And, and, and there's certainly some kind of thought that, well, we might slow walk this in terms of getting it past the election so that nobody knows whether it's real or not, whatever we've done. But there is a need, like in terms of putting the budget together. And so if we have an injunction and this all gets put into escrow, then you know we're going to have to do the 2014 budget uh, or 2015 budget basically on, uh, uh, you know, with, without assuming that the pension thing didn't happen and so there there are some cross pressures and, and it's always hard to tell about litigation I mean a judge could say there's nothing you know I until it takes effect nobody's getting hurt but uh, or it could you know again there's there are cross pressures on how fast we move it the thing I think that's interesting about the court case is this is an area where speaker Madigan still has indirect influence uh, in terms of the way politics works in Illinois. Democrats have the majority on the Illinois Supreme Court, and Speaker Madigan, as head of the Democratic Party of Illinois, helps some of those get elected, and uh, these are sometimes judicial races where a lot of money is spent for, uh, again, an office a lot of people don't really pay attention to. So while he may not be able to call them up and say, vote this way, some people do, realize there is a debt there. That won't ever come out that that's the way a vote is, and maybe it won't affect the justice's view. It's not supposed to, but I think it's certainly another fun thing to watch while you're there. Well, and we're gonna have to leave it at that. The bill goes into effect in June, but the lawsuit is hoping to put that on hold, so if you're at home trying to figure out what's gonna happen with your pension, you may have to wait a little bit longer to really know what's going on. I'd like to thank my guests, Bill, Professor Redfield, and Pat, thanks for being on the show, and we'll see you next time on Capitol View.